Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you hear and you see me. Uh, I'm Danila. So today I'm going to talk about how to make the most out of your compiler. Uh, first of all, who am I? Uh, I am a software engineer at Google. I work in data pipeline and efficiency and infrastructure. It's map reviews and so on. In the past, I was working on core search engine at Yandex, one of the most popular search engine in Russia. Um, I am a ClickHouse contributor uh, concerning efficiency and infrastructure. I'm C++ uh, library and compiler contributor from time to time, and I teach C++ in universities. Uh, some disclaimer, this talk is going to be opinionated, maybe like a little bit uh, following the fashion, but uh, these are my opinions and the opinions we, and uh, the results that I saw from different projects. Also, I'll take all questions at, at the end, so we'll have seven to 10 minutes. All right, let's start. Um, there is a rumor going on uh, among engineers who write C++ that you should trust your compiler. That's true, that's reasonable. I mean, you start learning C++ and you should compile your program in order to execute it, and you should trust this uh, like process. Compilers are smart, that's also true. Compilers can do some weird optimizations and uh, you just um, true like and I mean you can build for debugging for optimization and so on and they do some really complex and interesting stuff. Don't over optimize. Uh, don't have any. Sometimes people call it don't do any premature optimizations. That's also true. I mean make it first of all like work then make it fast. And uh, uh, biggest rumor that C plus plus is fast. Probably it's one of the fastest language on the market. Today, I'm going to debunk all four uh, points uh, in some way or another. And let's start with uh, actually the compiler and why you should trust it. Uh, overall, uh, I believe that one of the biggest problems that engineers have when they write C++ is that after thousands of hours of practicing, they still don't understand how to write a barely working compiler. So for example, I don't know if you have some uh, line of code that uh, I present, probably you need some time to, to, to process it. And if you don't, congratulations, uh, like you are probably uh, like a very good C++ expert. And uh, um, on the other hand, we prioritize freedom. So we don't have any centralized build system or centralized compiler. And uh, we explicitly say that uh, and mean that people should choose C++ to control. However, most engineers don't have any idea what, what, what's happening behind this black box of uh, like named compiler. Uh, still, uh, what uh, like you choose, C probably if you write C++, you have a reason to do that. Uh, this reason may be speed or like expressing as history, knowledge, hiring, like a system tooling, whatever. And uh, uh, some of this you can control. For example, you can hire good engineers that have long experience of, uh, uh, C of learning and doing C++. But two things uh, that I'm gonna talk today more is about speed and tooling. So wh what's going to happen on the compiler level? And uh, we all know our best and beloved compilers uh, that you use. Uh, I believe uh, like compiler market is not very big. Maybe dozens of them exist, uh, which I know of. Uh, most popular, I believe, are GCC, LLVM, MSCC, Intel. There are some others for sure. For example, IBM compiler. Uh, but today I'm going to focus on the most popular ones as it, um, as it uh, covers uh, more engineers who do their job. Uh, I'm going to focus more on LLVM and Clang. Most points will be will be available for GCC. Some points uh, are also like also present for MSVC, and uh, um, so I believe uh, I'll try to be as generic as possible. But uh, on the other hand, I'll try to suggest something very specific when it comes down to uh, like specific options or something like that. All right, and uh, yes, uh, LLVM has around 1,800 options to configure. And uh, that's actually blew my mind when I tried to dump all of them. And that's true. You can customize your compiler as much as you want or fine tune it. Uh, also, uh, like there is, uh, like you can configure a compiler. On the other hand, uh, there are recent breakthroughs. I believe uh, that uh, quite, 
quite quite good to know. For example, SIMD JSON is uh, the library where, like that was written not so long ago, maybe two to three years, and uh, it parses JSON and does nothing else. So it really it's it's really good in parsing. And you can see that the closest competitor is like two times slower than than this library. And the most popular library for JSON is like uh, JSON for modern C++ is like parsing at speed of 100 megs when SIMD JSON goes to, th to three gigs. Uh, but this is the same C++, same set of inputs, same compilers, and what's, what's actually different? Well, uh, like good answer, truth, the truth is like it's really complicated, but let's uh, briefly discuss some moments and then we dive into them. Uh, first of all, like it's called SIMD JSON. It uses SIMD instructions, which stand for single instruction multiple data, for example, to work with 16, 32, or 64 bytes at the same time. And SIMD JSON is full of that thing. Uh, so like it uses uh, like this weird intrinsics and uh, uh, does a good job of uh, providing like of uh, processing more data in one instruction. Uh, also, like this library uses lots of compiler options and compiler extensions. For example, it uses sometimes the target the targets of SSE 4.2 and other uh, other instruction sets and so on. Uh, well, probably the most uh, like the most significant part is that it was put like I know hundreds of hours into that by providing the best possible performance. This picture is not very relevant. You should not read it very carefully, but it just shows that, I mean, uh, like uh, the code generation is very, very, uh, very pipelined. And it's very good for processing like really wide registers. So uh, lots of hours were, were put into optimizing like parsing JSON. So, and the point that uh, I wanna make here is that don't blame your compiler for being slow. Uh, they will not generate best possible code, code for you for various reasons, because uh, it's sometimes hard. The compilers also, also have trade-offs. Uh, it's uh, like, I don't know, uh, really, really hard to compute the best, uh, the fastest program that, uh, that, that solves your problem if, it, if, it, if it's even possible. Um, also one point that mildly relevant, but still I want to point this that, uh, there is a chance your code base will grow and you won't notice. So for example, if you build a library or a project, you write code, you write code, after a year, you probably still write co code and so on. Um, that means that uh, like you, uh, like simple tasks like parsing JSON can be optimized to, to 30 times. And probably if you write code, you have some potential for optimizations due to, the, to this, I don't know, SIMD instructions or compiler options and so on. And there is likely a huge gap. You won't control this. They, like in this sense, you should trust your compiler. However, um, I'm gonna show you some options that can fine tune it to, to get a little bit more out of this uh, mess, uh, like out of this you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And uh, I split this into four parts and uh, three of them are forgotten stories. One is not very forgotten, but we'll talk about it. So first forgotten story that uh, some engineers just don't understand for some reason or don't uh, pay attention too much is the visibility. Uh, here is the simplest code. You have a library, uh, .h. There are two functions, for and var. There is library.cc. The implementations of four bar, everything seems normal. You compile library.cc and then link with, uh, for example, main.cc. And main.cc just uh, includes library and somewhere calls foo and bar. And the question for me is whether you can, whether the calls can be uh, interchanged. So first we call bar and then foo can compiler actually, uh, is compiler allowed to do that? And pretty straightforwardly, I believe the answer is no, uh, that it cannot, like if it has foo and then bar, like it cannot call first bar and then foo, even if it, if it's, for example, beneficial for performance, because for example, you have global memory and you lock, can lock some statements. This is a side effect. You write to some file or to some STD out and you just cannot, uh, you cannot mess uh, with this ordering. Uh, but for compilers, it actually may be like even beneficial. So compilers just don't see it, but um, I mean, they can. 
Uh, if they knew something about foo and bar better, probably they can interchange or inline some line or inline some pieces of code and so on. Um, to increase the visibility to compiler, yes, you can write into headers, and we have actually uh, infrastructure in C++ for that. So you can write the inline keyword uh, upon the function, or if the function is templated, it's inline by default. But my uh, suggestion, please don't do that very often. So it really, really, really increases the uh, like the compile times. If you include headers in multiple times, this function is going to be duplicated in each uh, in each source file. And uh, your compile times just become significantly so significantly bigger. Well, um, compile times are important as well as performance is important. So how should we balance it? Uh, there is a reasonable question um, that uh, yes, if we don't write in headers, we lose performance. That's true. That actually happens in practice. Uh, I say always that productivity is important. Please don't don't ignore that. Point. Uh, what I uh, I want to suggest is the middle ground for that. So it's called link time optimizations. And so some of that some of you may may heard this, but that that's still a very important part. So what's link time optimization itself? So you have three stages of compilation. Uh, during C it's like preprocessor, the compilation itself, and the the linkage stage. And uh, link time optimizations happen only on the third stage, where actually all code uh, is visible and LTO sees all program. So it, it for example, it will see that foreign bar are compiled in library.cc from, from my example and will try to optimize to inline them probably into, into, the, into main. Um, however, uh, LTO, if it sees all program, it may not be very scalable if your code base is huge. So for example, LLVM provides a technology called thin LTO. So, and the main idea behind that is that it, it generates actually not the libraries, but it generates the intermediate representation. We will talk later a little bit about it. Uh, it provides some summaries of actually all potential optimizations that can be, can be done. For example, if the function is big, there is no point in inlining it. But if the function is small, probably, probably it can be inlined. And by removing this, I don't know, big functions or unnecessary information, uh, we increase scalability. Yes, we lose some optimizations, which can be potentially be applied in simple LTO case, but thin LTO still uh, tries to get this middle ground between scalability for large code bases or even like mildly, mildly, mildly big uh, code bases and compile times. So yeah, uh, flags for a compiler dash FLTO like in GCC and Clang and uh, FLTO equals thing, uh, it's available only in LLVM. Uh, what we actually observed, so uh, we observed it, the performance gains from around zero to 10%. In Google, we saw like on average three, four, mm, like it, it depends on workload, but still like it's not a trivial amount of uh, like CPU cycles. Uh, okay, so possible workflow for you to develop, like link time optimization all increases uh, the compile time, that's true. Uh, however, uh, like you can have usual builds without any uh, link time optimizations, release builds with link time optimizations. Um, in that case, you will gain all the performance gains and you will have better opportunity to like to iterate over uh, your code by not blowing the compile times. Usual LTO may be unscalable, so that's true. For example, we probably saw that LTO starts to ooming, so not enough memory, from 50 to 100,000 lines of code. So uh, be careful if your code base grows, so LTO may, be, uh, may, may not be the best solution for you. So thin LTO like, provides better middle ground. Example, this is an open source analytics database, ClickHouse, uh, cares about performance a lot, has lots of SMD uh, like processing and so on. So one of the key features of ClickHouse is performance. It has 400,000 lines of code. Uh, we tried uh, LTO a couple of years ago. We got 2% 2 per, 2 performance gains. It still was not at the, uh, at the pace of GCC, but uh, actually, eventually we removed, like Clang become, became faster than GCC. Uh, and we removed GCC from it, but FLTO just uh, didn't finish, uh, like simple LTO didn't finish. 
caveats. Uh, you can argue, uh, you can like argue that yes, uh, we can have uh, the builds when you iterate, you test uh, and release builds, but you don't test what you really build. That's a valid point. Um, from my experience, as for example at Google, we haven't seen any problems for thousands of targets. Uh, and what actually helped, sanitizer usage helps. So it tries to find all undefined behavior that can be exploitable. And uh, integration testing helps. So please, uh, if you do some changes into your uh, build, uh, just try to have some integration testing. Or as an alternative, try to build once a day, for example, um, uh, the release build, and then uh, test all, all of your test, test suite. So that also can work. All right, so uh, more visibility to the compiler opens more optimizations, and these are, these are not non-trivial non ones. Next story, it's not actually, uh, it's not the story that people forget, but still uh, they have some confusion about it. So for example, like there are optimization levels, dash of zero, dash, dash of one, dash of two, uh, dash, um, dash of three, dash of fast. So what do they actually mean? Uh, in order to understand what they actually mean, let's dive a, a little bit into the architecture of, of the compilers. Uh, fortunately, GCC and LVM in some sense have similar architectures. Um, like roughly there are three parts. So front end is like understanding the semantics uh, of C++ and uh, tr uh, like converting into the IR. IR is intermediate representation of the uh, which is, I know, has all good properties. For example, static single assignment, like no variable can be assigned twice. And uh, like lots of theory behind that uh, is done, like uh, why it is better and so on. So compiler people know better why IR is good for compilers. So middle end is uh, like the stage where the optimizations over IR happen, or like sometimes compiler people like to call them canonicalizations more, but uh, optimizations probably is a little bit like more popular word. Uh, and understandable ones. And the backend is actually the real code gen, how we translate the optimized IR into the architectural uh, assembly and probably even apply a couple more optimizations that are specific for the microarchitecture that we do, that we build for. Um, for example, Clang has uh, like very, uh, very strict, uh, like split into three stages, like for example, like, it uh, tries to understand the semantics of C++, checks for all errors. Then it goes into the optimizer. Optimizer consists of so-called passes. Uh, passes, like there are I know, a couple of hundreds passes, I believe now in uh, LLVM, which uh, like transform IER uh, into more, into a better optimized way. Then there is the backend stuff, which also has a couple of like several passes from our for micro architectural uh, optimizations and then it translates into binary. And GCC has similar, so it, it takes the uh, the text input, tr translates into AST, then it translates into generic AST, then it translates to GIMPL, which is like intermediate representation. A uh, couple of more stages that I don't wanna uh, dive into, but uh, like you still need to understand that there are passes. Like these passes are probably one of the most important uh, are parts of the compiler just like what makes C++ fast or like actually uh, like any language fast. Uh, so uh, middle end, uh, yes, these optimizations happen over the intermediate representation. Uh, they consist of several stages, uh, mostly uh, like cleanup, canonicalization, simplification, optimization, target specific optimizations, for example, inst combine is the pass which is responsible for instruction combine, uh, like dead code elimination, uh, whatever you can think of any optimization that can be applied. Probably a couple more, a couple, th a couple of passes that uh, are not quite so popular, like for example, inliner, it tries to understand which functions should, should be like inlined into the, um, into, the into the IR and uh, loop optimization. So how do we, uh, rotate loops or delete loops or unroll loops or vectorize loops and so on. So uh, these are quite important. And uh, basically dash of zero, dash of one, dash of, and so on mean that like the level of like passes that you actually wanna uh, in your um, 
in your build. So for example, Desho Zero, almost no passes, probably a couple of them, just some very simple ones. Desho One includes some passes, Desho Two includes like most passes, Desho Three includes all passes. I believe the biggest differences between Desho Zero, Desho One, then Desho One, Desho Two, but difference between two and three levels are not very big. Uh, we'll see a little later but, uh, what I mean. Uh, Desho Fast actually is quite dangerous and uh, it includes Desho 3 and fast math plus some weird more uh, flags which I don't want to mention right now. So fast math, for example, thinks uh, that your floating point arithmetic is cumulative, that your floating point arithmetic is finite and, and all this stuff which probably can be dangerous in general case. So if you use Desho Fast, be careful. So really be careful. Uh, so, for example, Desho 3 in GCC includes several options, and probably the most important ones are the loop unrolling, and that's the biggest difference between Desho 2 and Desho 3 in GCC. So, uh, and yeah, uh, fast math uh, sets some flags with uh, unsafe uh, math optimization flags, and when I see the word unsafe, I uh, I become a little bit suspicious, like whether I actually need it. So, for example, I haven't seen that Dash of Fast be deployed to some really big projects because of these concerns. But it can be useful in some cases. Uh, good news loop vectorization is enabled by default in Dash of 2 from GC12, yet GC12 is not yet released. Uh, so, uh, we'll see if it's going to be rolled back or not. No, I hope not. Uh, yes, let's open our uh, best site called Godbolt, and you can see uh, GCC uh, on the left is the code, which basically sums the vector, nothing more, vector of integers and dash 2 in GCC, uh, just does some very simple loop and uh, in dash 3 it does really, really uh, stuff that probably compiler engineers know better or what they mean. So that's the biggest difference in GCC. Um, LLVM with dash of three is not very much different from dash of two. It includes a couple of passes, so and a couple of um, option adjustments and loop and switching and so on. So uh, in LLVM, dash of two, dash of three are almost almost the same, like from my experience. Uh, yeah, and one example that I can show you just for the record, uh, uh, like on the left, there is some weird, uh, weird code that computes the number of ones in the 32 bit integer. And client with dash 03 understands that it's a pop count instruction. However, with dash 02, it doesn't understand it. And, uh, uh, and uh, the pass that's responsible for that, I believe, called aggressive inst combine. Uh, yes, this is aggressive inst combine pass. So it's just purely for an example. Um, my point, please use dash o zero dash g j's for debug information for debugging purposes, use dash o three for optimization purposes. Sometimes I hear that dash o zero is too slow for debugging. That's also can be true. And uh, please uh, make sure uh, that, uh, I mean, just, it's fine. It, it's okay if it's too slow. Uh, my suggestion will be to use these three options, uh, dash o one if no mid frame pointer, no optimized sibling calls. What do they actually mean? Dash o one does include some optimizations, but it has uh, like uh, lower restrictions on inliner and so on. If no mid frame pointer, like, is the option that saves the base pointer, it provides better stack traces. If no optimized sibling calls, uh, removes tail call elimination and debuggers are less confused uh, that I know this function is deleted. And if, for example, if you have a breakpoint to some line of code, um, it the, like it may never be hit uh, because uh, it was you know, tail call optimized and dash show one includes tail call optimization. Um, there is a flag called dash OG, so optimized debugging experience. I believe it's it works nicely only in GCC, so uh, for LLVM, this is not uh, the case. So uh, if you use GCC, probably dash OG is already good for debugging. Um, 
what what else can I tell you about passes? Um, I I know a couple of years ago I had a request from a friend. Um, they were suspecting compiler bug uh, because everything was working in debug mode. Sanitizers were passing, and uh, uh, like the only uh, the only place that uh, that was buggy is the release the release mode. And uh, first of all, I thought that some undefined behavior for sure, because I mean, most bugs are in software rather, other, rather than in compilers. Uh, but what I actually suggested if they uh, struggle and if they think that this is a bug in optimizers, there is a so-called uh, uh, optimization bisecting. So you can uh, have all passes, there are you know, a couple hundreds of them, and you just can bisect uh, to the pass, which I could does. Mm -hmm does the worst job or um, or vice versa for example if if you want to understand which pass optimizes your code and for example to debug it to look into it into uh, from the source code of the compiler uh, option is called like that dash m l l v m uh, dash opt dash bisect dash limit equals some number uh, I don't know any uh, of this infrastructure in GCC, but if you know, please let me know. So uh, I used several times bisecting for debugging purposes or for understanding why optimization applies or not. And yes, friend actually found the pass that uh, they were running. It was called to address instruction pass. I have no idea what that actually does, uh, but there is some documentation for that. And yeah, some very long function, which is probably not very important. Um, it really was a bug. And uh, we were able to find it in pretty short time. So by uh, understanding the architectural level of the compilers and how you can control your passes and how you can enable some of them, disable some of them and so on. Another request that I had uh, some time ago is uh, for example, one, uh, one of the developer of ClickHouse uh, changed uh, the operator less to operator not equal uh, in some for a loop, and they got plus 30% of loop performance, which was reflected in some real uh, real query. And I asked them, like, uh, are, are they sure that this is the only change? They were quite sure, uh, but these were almost raw pointers. So really, so th this is a very uh, very simple code to for, for the compiler actually to vectorize. However. Uh, this was not the case, what I suggested to a friend. Uh, LLVM, for example, has analysis, analysis options for some uh, passes, and they can provide diagnosis, uh, diagnosis of uh, like whether the pass, what, like uh, what, what is the outcome of this optimization on this piece of code. And uh, yes, uh, LLVM actually told us that loop not vectorized could not determine number of loop iterations. And for some reason, it was not happening when you write the, uh, the operator not equal. Uh, this was really, really suspicious. Uh, the truth behind that is quite complicated. Uh, what actually happened? So this was a boost iterator. And for example, as you can see for boost iterator facade relation, uh, like the uh, operators equal equal or not equal were uh, like using one macro and for random access relation, they were using another macro. And I believe the problem was that the second macro generated lots of code. So this code, uh, so this macro was expanded into something like that. I omitted some parts of it. So, uh, and it was just hard for the compiler to probably hit some limit, which we don't understand. Uh, but this actually happened, and uh, we were quite happy to remove the iterator and just uh, go with raw pointers and have 30% performance win. Forgotten story, which I also, uh, uh, like maybe not so forgotten, but I see that users don't exploit that as much as they should. It's the microarchitecture. And uh, microarchitecture is a, a good thing because, I mean, hardware evolves, uh, new instructions are added, caches and cache lines also grow. So uh, why not using all this cool stuff? And uh, uh, disclaimer, 
So what I'm going to tell next, it purely depends on the hardware you run. Uh, I'll try to provide some summary of what's available in cloud or in data centers, which I, uh, I, was, oper I was developing for and so on. And uh, then we will talk about some uh, generic, generic device on that. X86, which is probably one of the most important or, or still architecture or microarchitecture for cloud processing. And if I split them in two to three errors, uh, one error I call it Westmere error. Westmere is the name of uh, the processor, uh, which was developed in 2010. And this, uh, this processor actually was the last processor to update uh, 16, almost the last processor to update all 16 byte instructions. For example, it provided SSE 4.2. Uh, and uh, let's briefly discuss. So SSE instruction sets are like SIMD instructions which operate with 16 bytes. Uh, carry less multiplication or PCL move is uh, like the multiplication of a Galois fields. It's beneficial for CRC checksumming and for erasure codes. Uh, AES is advanced encryption set, which is used like highly in uh, some uh, infrastructure like OpenSSL and so on. Uh, CS CX16 is log free 16 byte atomics. Pop count like, is the pop count instruction. So, uh, Vesmir Air was the last one to have uh, all these 16 byte, 16 byte operation, uh, 16 byte instructions. And then only in 2013, we have Haswell processors, which uh, introduced uh, wider 32-byte registers and uh, bit manipulation instructions, which can manipulate actually on registers of smaller size, but uh, they were uh, added only in Haswell. And FMA, it's like multiply addition, A plus equals B times, times C, it's good for some dot product mm, multiplication, I believe. Um, Okay, so I uh, also, I mean, you can argue we have AVX 512 in recent processors, that's also true. And uh, I wanna uh, have a note on that, that why just don't we default to AVX, AVX2, AVX 512 by default? Uh, so AVX 512 is pretty recent and uh, actually the problems came even from AVX2. So if you share, for example, AVX code with non-AVX, you have CPU down clocking. If some, uh, if some uh, binary that surrounds you is running only SSE and you're running, running AVX, there can be problems. If you use heavy AVX uh, instructions, for example, some floating point instructions, then it's also CPU down clocking. And when your CPU has uh, less frequency, your program becomes slower. And uh, that, behavior was observed on all processors like before like Skylake and including Skylake or even Cascade Lake as I remember from Ice Lake but Ice Lake was three two to three years ago as I remember it becomes better so uh, only two to three years ago we actually have a stable we have stable AVX2 instruction which you know doesn't harm uh, overall CPU performance. And uh, that's why, for example, AVX, AVX2, AVX512 is not very widely used uh, by default. And uh, uh, next slide, uh, spoiler, next slide is gonna be like absolutely subjective, subjective opinionated, comes from my experience, but let's see uh, what you can do with your architecture. So you start with your architecture. Um, let's first discuss the x86 one. If you have some hardware that's before 2010, I would consider like the question for you, can you throw it away? If you can, just throw it away and replace it with something more modern. If you cannot, that's also a possibility. For example, you develop browser or you develop library that's gonna be uh, shipped to people that uh, with, with any hardware, very white hardware. So just don't touch anything then. Um, if you have, uh, if you're sure that your processors are like at least 18 years, uh, like uh, newer than 18 years long, uh, use options like SSE 4.2, AES, PCL mode, CX16, pop count. If you have um, something between Haswell and Cascade Lake, for example, if you can if you can prove that all your processors you, that you run hardware are at least Haswell, uh, try to use the options so-called MArch equal Haswell and prefer vector width one to eight. And uh, this option, prefer vector width, actually 
this allows compiler to use 32 byte uh, instructions, which uh, is a good thing not to downclock your CPU. And if you have something from Ice Lake, yeah, I see no reasons not to uh, include AVX2, FMA, BMI, and probably you can think of AX512, but be careful, not all processors support AV AVX512. For example, some a AMD ones do not, and uh, so be careful with that. Uh, if you have some, like on other architectures, it's a little bit simpler. For example, for ARM, if you have, uh, I don't know any data for ARM v7 actually, but probably it's the same for like ARM v8, v8 and ARM v9, uh, use the option like uh, MArch ARM version uh, plus like some extensions, which some of them are by default, but uh, I, I see actually like most of them being available in, in processors. For PowerPC, uh, also if you have something older than P8, Power not Power 8, just probably you know what you do. Uh, but if you have P8, P9, not P10, just use MCPU power and LTVEC. LTVEC is the SIMD for power processors. Uh, so it's pretty simple. For x86, it becomes complicated because of some effects which uh, were not quite desired. All right, uh, point of all this is that compilers assume really, really or ha hardware. For example, GCC and Clan now defaults to core two, which is 2006. And probably you don't, probably uh, there's a high chance that you develop code for uh, much more modern hardware than, than this one. And just exploit that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I also want to note that sometimes I hear from engineers, I can use the native architecture like for, uh, for compiling and I highly don't recommend this uh, because native architecture is architecture where you build. And uh, if you don't have the control over your hardware or you don't know which processors you run, uh, then uh, it may become really, really costly because of illegal instructions. Uh, if you can control the hardware and you know you're very homogeneous, then probably it's fine, but still just use a march equal hardware you run on. Uh, so native is a dangerous option. Be careful with that and probably try to avoid it. Okay, I was talking a lot about micro uh, architecture and all these new instructions. And these instructions are not very uh, commonly used. And I believe that if you write code in C++, most of you just don't write this in this IMD. And the question, the valid question you can ask, why would you want that? Um, I would say that third-party libraries, really, really core libra libraries require that. For example, SIMD JSON uh, has this uh, division between Vestmere and Haswell. If you have SSE 4.2, you have better implementation. If you have Haswell AVX2, you have better, even better implementation. And fallback uh, is gonna be slower than that. So, and probably you don't wanna waste cycles in J JSON parsing and that, that, that's just a reasonable approach. Um, for example, Hyperscan, Hyperscan is the library for fast uh, regex search, and it also has, uh, it actually has even more splits, so it requires minimum SSS E3, but it uh, has SSE 4.2, division pop count instruction, BMI, BMI2, uh, IVX2. Some base 44 libraries also require AVX, AVX2 to get the maximum performance. ZSTD compression algorithm that is very commonly used right now requires BMI2 for exploiting that and being fast. Mm -hmm. uh, Google's compression library, uh, Snappy or Zippy like requires, uh, it does not require it just fallbacks to a, a non-optimized version. Uh, if it doesn't have BMI2, for example. Uh, Yandex, or where I worked, also has the library called FastOps, which is like for fast mathematical operations. It also has this division. OpenSSL has this division. So I believe uh, almost all core libraries right now that do care about performance, they really, really try to exploit uh, these new instructions in some way, and it's their job. And what's, what's, what's required from you is just to allow them to do their job. Uh, you, the only thing you can do is just to adjust your hardware, which you actually use. 
and options. All right, uh, next forgotten story, which I kind of hear from many people, uh, like not, not from many people, it's function inlining. So function inlining is the real inlining where you have a function and you try to inline so that you don't have any epilogue or prologue in, in, into the assembly. And uh, my observation that generally inlining increases performance. For example, thin L2 uh, tries to get all these small functions and inline them so you don't waste any cycles. Um, like probably the real truth is that if you inline really, really hard, uh, then your uh, code is impossible to optimize, impossible to find patterns, and it just became become slower. And so this is like a U-shaped thing. So you, if you don't inline anything, you're slow. If you inline something very good, you're fast. But if you inline everything, you're also slow. So uh, this is optimum that is pretty hard to find. Function inlining in compilers, as I understand, is a is a cost-based model. So it tries to compute some uh, value, uh, like tries to un like understand function how like what's inside how how expensive it is and so on and if it's not expensive or if it has some good properties for example it can inline first couple of lines of code that checks for some errors and so on it just inlines so and there is a threshold by which uh, it inlines function uh, or not and yes, as I said, you cannot inline everything. That's a trade-off between compile time and the runtime. And it'll, sometimes inlining is bad. If you inline too much, instruction cache may grow or like compiler may not understand what you actually need. Uh, LLVM has this option for inline threshold. It's called dash MLLVM dash inline dash threshold equals to some number. Default is 225. This default is pretty good. And uh, the truth is, if you increase that default, uh, compile times grow. Uh, if you decrease that, uh, that threshold, compiles time fasten. And uh, um, <laughs> disclaimer, inlining increases your build size, as I said, because I mean, you inline more and uh, now you, like before that you can reference to one piece of code. Now you, if you inline, you inline it to every single function that, that uses it. So it increases the build size. Compile time also increases. That's a trade-off between uh, like uh, performance and compile times. And uh, for example, here uh, and for example, I tried to use it in uh, several open source projects. And for example, this one of them, inline threshold equals to 2,000. Increase the compile time by seven minutes from 30 to 37, as I remember. Um, inline threshold 500 increased uh, from 30 to 33, and they increased build size by 30 and. 10% respectively, as I remember. But they increased performance. They genuinely increased performance by 4 and 2%. And uh, uh, that thing uh, is just, on one hand, that's a compiler issue. That's a like, compiler should better understand what to inline, what not. On the other hand, that's a pretty cheap uh, like performance gain. Just increase the inline threshold, you get better performance. So uh, let me actually show one, one uh, funny example that uh, some engineers also think are good uh, uh, to share. Um, this is a gold bolt link uh, where I have two functions. I have function that inline stuff uh, that is marked inline. And the other function is not inline. Generally, inline function is not about inlining. So it's not about function aligning. However, for example, LLVM, um, maybe for a reason, maybe because there is a common understanding that a line should be, uh, should inline function. It uh, has some thresh, it has some bigger threshold for the functions that are marked inline. In this example, you can see that function G inline was fully inline and called F like several times and they are just called. But G non inline just, uh, has a call to G non inline, and this has a, a separate logic. Uh, and uh, I'm not lying. If I write inline in G non inline, uh, I believe uh, everything will be inlined. Yes. So um, this example just shows that, I mean, inline keyword matters in some sense, but uh, that's also reflects your inlining. But uh, uh, that doesn't mean that you should write all your functions with inline. And actually, a lot of functions in C++ are implicitly inlined. 
uh, for example, all class member functions are in line, all template functions are in line. And uh, I believe this only helps for uh, functions that are written in headers, which you probably shouldn't write and uh, in headers. And uh, the only thing that remains is like the source file where you do something in an anonymous namespace. Uh, but don't over exploit that. So that's that's just a funny fact that some engineers argue that inline has nothing to do with performance. Uh, however, uh, it probably uh, can can have an effect. Um, there's also a separate attribute called always in line, and uh, this in line is the ad, uh, just marks. It's the compiler extension, and it marks that the functions should be in line always. Uh, I saw some usages of that in weird places and very like hot places. Uh, be careful with that. So, and, but uh, it can be used. Um, I have an idea which I was not able to check on big scale, but on small scale, it was working nicely. For example, just get like compile your project with inline threshold 1000 or 5000, whatever, wherever you prefer, compare benchmarks and uh, see what actually has been improved or, or if nothing, then you're fine. Uh, if something has been improved, just put always in line attribute on, on the calls that were in line with that threshold and uh, just uh, have a clear win without binary binary increase. But that's an idea uh, which, which probably has some sense. All right. Uh, I believe that we'll skip the function, uh, uh, the function alignment. Uh, so briefly, I'll say about it. So uh, sometimes, uh, ooh, due to microarchitectural reasons and uh, uh, some problems, you can commit code which have some benchmarks degrade in some other place, absolutely unrelated. And uh, uh, the reason behind that almost like usually is because of functional loop alignment. And what I wanna tell here that uh, sometimes it's better to uh, align functions and uh, and branches. And uh, for example, these two options helped us to reduce the variance of uh, of benchmarks and uh, stabilize uh, and actually stabilize them. So we don't have any weird requests where you know some uh, random code uh, degrade degrades the performance by thirty percent of a hot place. Um, yes, so they highly stabilize benchmarks at Google, at Google and at ClickHouse. I'll probably uh, skip that a little bit just to take more questions. Um, standard library. This one uh, I also want to talk about. So uh, likely compilers come with standard library. GC has libstd C++, Clang has libc++, uh, MSFC has its own standard library. And uh, I believe the main difference is that, uh, that of performance difference are uh, in projects that actually using lots of uh, that I used a lot, for example, vector strings, uh, for example, small string optimization size differs from library to library in lib C++ it's 22, in libstd C++ it's 16, in Facebook library it's 23, and uh, in MSVC it's also, I believe, 16. Some libraries use cow string, uh, like copy and write strings and so on. Um, vector string resizing policy also matters there, uh, probably some unordered containers and a couple of functions like std sort or something like that. So, uh, but probably the biggest difference that I saw that actually uh, caught my eye is the additional options that these libraries have. And uh, uh, for example, Leaf C++ has the option called unstable ABI. And uh, now we are going to into a very, very, uh, 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 controversial topic about ABI. But for example, if you build everything from source, you can allow to use this option. Uh, you can allow yourself to use this option. And unstable ABI actually improves the performance of lots of uh, things. For example, it improves uh, the string string uh, optimization for, for, for some assignments. Uh, it improves actually the uh, unique pointer uh, and uh, it improves unique pointer in a way that probably some of you know, but uh, let me address this. So um, uh, like on the left, just simple function G, which calls F and moves 
uh, unique pointer. And unfortunately, due to Itanium ABI on x86, uh, you uh, like if the object is not trivially destructible, you need to store it in a pointer. And you can see that uh, like this thing actually does something uh, with the pointer dereference and so on. So that's uh, not very good. And that just increases the code and some 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 CPU cycles. However, if you use a trivial ABI, uh, the difference is that the call is responsible for destroying. Uh, and uh, I believe there almost has been no breakages at Google when we tried that option. Um, so it just uh, forwards the call to F. So and it removes all all these unnecessary instructions that are not that should not be used. Um, so let me get back. Um, yes, for example, at Google, we saw around 2% build size win uh, from enabling this unstable ABI option just to remove the overhead of, of pointers. Uh, but it requires building from source. If you can't allow that, uh, then don't, don't listen to me. So. Um, Standard also progresses. For example, C++ 20 has char AT. It's one of the best feature for performance. The difference between char and char AT is that uh, char, uh, char AT cannot overlap with any other data, whereas char, char star pointers to char can, uh, can. And we saw some good significant gains uh, out of that in ClickHouse because ClickHouse is a column-based oriented system and uh, marking the columns uh, mark, marking the columns with char ET is quite desired. And for example, uh, here was the loop. So it was doing some moves and these two moves were used to avoid pointer aliasing and uh, they were just removed and we got several curious with better performance. So in total, uh, several points that this talk covered. Visibility, optimization passes, microarchitecture, standard library, Inlining, inlining is more optional, but still it, it may be useful if you care about performance. What I haven't covered in this talk is profile guided optimization and what it tries to do, it just tries to collect the profiles and have better loop inline decisions for future compilations. Uh, Post-link optimizations where you don't need to recompile anything, but just to rebuild the binary uh, to build blocks together, which are uh, executed quite frequently to avoid cache misses of code. So on new pass manager, it's default in client 13. That's why I decided not to cover it, but it's like better pass, stress, pass manager strategy in, uh, in LLVM and it affects mostly in lining and tooling. So Clang Tidy has a full thing dedicated to static analysis. And now let's come to the juiciest part, results. So Mozilla Firefox. Uh, Mozilla Firefox decided to move from GCM SFC to Clang. It uses for release builds LTO PGO, it used experimental new pass manager, but it's default in Clang 13. Five to seven percent win on their tests, on their user tests. Um, yes, and here is the mark that they actually tried GCC plus PGO and they moved to Clang, Clang, plus, Clang plus PGO plus LTO. Uh, Stockfish, a uh, chess based engine. So uh, it's like a chess engine. Uh, they use uh, LTO, experimental new, experimental new pass manager. Uh, options up to AVX 512 and they achieved parity performance LVM and G between GC. They uh, had 3% win or around 20 ELO points. Yannick search engine where I worked. Uh, we used microarchitectural uh, SSE 4.2, FLTO equal thing because the project was big and had lots of legacy, AVX FMA uh, for hot paths. We transitioned to libc++, moved from GCC, Increase the inline threshold to 1,000. 7% better average queue response time. And uh, I mean, like there are lots of backends for search engines. That was a huge, huge win. Uh, one trading company, which I once helped for some reason, just it was a talk with a friend, and uh, uh, they use uh, they uh, use LTO thing, uh, March equals Haswell, and inline threshold 1,000 for release builds. 4% faster strategy response. They dropped GCC in favor of LLVM. And this was, uh, I actually see bias in trading companies that they prefer GCC because uh, it's still faster. And I believe that's uh, a questionable case right now. And you just need to uh, preserve two compilers and to compare them from time to time. 
ClickHouse probably, which I talked a lot in this uh, there. So we transitioned from GC to LLVM, Dash 3 SSE 4.2, FLTL thing, transition to libc++, and stable ABI, char ET, function alignment. And we tried inline threshold, but we may reconsider. We For now, we dropped it because of build size increase. 7 to 10% better query response, 12% binary size uh, win. So that came from uh, LTO theme because it removed the functions that were not used anywhere and from unstable ABI, which decreased the overhead of uh, smart pointers. Uh, Google's perspective. We run everything with client LLVM. Uh, we use a thin LTO for release builds. For testing, we don't use LTO. Uh, PGO for highly important binaries, SSE 4.2 or Haswell, if we can prove that it will be run on on modern hardware, and we moved from recently we moved from Libs to DC++ to Libc++. It's very hard to understand the savings, to be honest. I believe it was around three to five, but that's really, really, really huge number. And uh, yeah, from a unique pointer uh, optimization, we got two to two five, two percent binary size win. And uh, that's it. So I'm happy to take questions. Uh, what could be the reasons for LTO not to improve the performance? That's a good question. Um, so, um, as I said, sometimes inlining is not very good. For example, it pollutes the instruction cache, and sometimes it's just good uh, to call a function which is, uh, which is, I don't know, of middle size or of middle to small size, and it's just going to be always into into the cache. And it, uh, and if it call if it's called from different places it's uh, actually better than it's inlined in these places. So I believe this, uh, I believe the answer is something like that. GCC has dash F fat LTO objects, but it seems like Clang does not. It, is it built in into Clang, Clang's LTO? To be honest, I don't know. So unfortunately, uh, let's follow up uh, with this question like I know, drop me an email or write me so 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 I can I can look into it and ask appropriate people. Um, next question is dash w aggressive loop optimization same as loop optimization from GC12. Uh, what can we use to enable loop optimizations pre GCC12? Um, use dash on three or there are some options. I have a link uh, to the code. Uh, uh, like in my slides, uh, just uh, the specific, the, the namings of the specific options you can enable to enable the vectorization. That, uh, w aggressive loop optimizations, I don't know. I actually think that when the option starts with W, it's a warning, uh, but I may, might be mistaken. So uh, the answer is just to look into, into code and adjust them. Could you comment on, next question from Rohit. Uh, could you comment on what PGO, POJO profile guided optimization in GCC is mimicked by Clang? And if you had any experience in your uh, experiments or results specifically about GCC plus PGO versus Clang plus PGO. As I said, uh, Mozilla Firefox had really, uh, really uh, uh, good experiments on trying GCC plus PGO versus Clang plus PGO and uh, Clang plus PGO actually won this competition. Um, so, uh, other than that, I actually am not very, I don't know real specifics or how PGO is different in Clang and GCC. <sighs> Next question. Is it enough to enable unique pointer optimization with just the lib CPP ABI unstable define? I believe yes, but uh, please read code. Uh, so, if defined libc cpp ABI unstable and or libcpp ABI version more, more equal to. So I believe yes. So I believe this defined should be enough to, uh, to enable a smart pointer optimization. Next question from Shirak. Uh, opaque function calls could be assumed to be strict memory barriers at places. Is that a safe assumption to make? Does that no longer hold for LTO? Um, I believe it holds for LTO, so LTO knows what should be a, a, a memory barrier or not if it's marked like that. So I believe I believe even compilers have extensions on marking the function opaque uh, or not. So 
uh, but I may be mistaken. So I, I'm like, um, that's all I know. Next question from Nina. Is it better to use thin LTO or full scale, mon full scale monolith monolithic LTO? I've heard that monolithic LTO still generates faster code, although linking is much slower. Um, so a uh, general suggestion from me, if your code is uh, small to middle size, I don't know, 25 lines, 1,000 lines of code is probably OK for LTO to handle. Uh, then it becomes then, but still, your pro like your project may grow. You need to understand that. Unfortunately, LTO has some cap on its scalability, and thin thin LTO uh, scales pretty widely. So I believe to several million lines of code, which is pretty hard to write. I believe only like several projects in the world hit that limit. So thin LTO is very good for scalability and. Uh, what I can suggest, just measure. Uh, we see sometimes that thin LTO is just better than LTO, but sometimes, but uh, probably uh, in most cases, you know, like 70% cases, yeah, LTO like you know, 0 0.5, 0 point like 1% faster. So if that really matters to you, that's 1%, stick to LTO, but be aware that this may not be scalable in the future. Um, I have no more open questions. I believe I will be in Gather Town after the end of the talk, so it, it will be in a couple of minutes. We are out of time. Uh, I believe that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. And uh, let's talk uh, there.